Hey everyone, uh, Andy Bromberg here, co-founder and president of Coinless. Very excited to be here at Unitize and even more excited to be speaking with Melton Ramirez, the Chief Strategy Officer at CoinShares. Melton, thanks for coming and joining me. Yeah, and Andy, I think you forgot one of the most important qualifications. Uh, we are also friends. <laughs> <laughs> we are also friends, more importantly, uh, longtime friends. One of the greatest things about this space is, uh, is that there are so many good friends doing interesting things. So yes, very happy to be here with you and, uh, and talk a little bit about some interesting things. I think, you know, we were chatting beforehand and, and realized we're just past the decade mark for crypto. Um, and it feels like we've gone through some transitions and maybe are at a little bit of a turning point now uh, talk about the next era. Um, and, and yeah. so we thought we'd, we'd look at a few trends in crypto and the financial ecosystem more broadly, uh, consider what's coming next. I'll maybe run through these three transitions we're seeing really quickly, um, and then we can, uh, we can dive in. Uh, awesome. I should also note, uh, we're pre-recording this session. It's currently June 17th. I say that only because things are changing day by day in the world, and uh, I don't want to be caught out here. So June 17th is when we're talking here. Who knows what will happen between now and, uh, and when this airs in, in early July. Um, but the three trends we thought we would talk about first within Bitcoin, uh, this movement from consumer to institutional that we've seen and now maybe going into uh, banking on Bitcoin. And what does that mean and, and where are we going with that? Um, second, uh, a little more broadly within crypto as a whole, we had the early days, we had, we've had boom times where everyone wants in. And now it feels like we're maybe seeing a little bit of a, a reversion to uh, what, what Melton's coined tools for the resistance. Um, and so that'll be, that'll be interesting to talk about. And then last, uh, within finance, most broadly, uh, we've seen a movement from, from fintech to, uh, to more broadly open banking and now into, uh, into open finance. All three of these trends Melton's been talking about for a while. Um, so, uh, so let's kick it off. Melton, can you just tell me a little bit about the first one within Bitcoin, this transition from consumer to institutional to maybe now banking? What do those mean and, and what's happening? Yeah. I think that's a great setup, Andy. Um, I think as we look at the first 11 years of Bitcoin, um, I've been working in Bitcoin since 2015, so I've been here for the last six years. What I think has been really interesting to observe, where Bitcoin first started and what makes Bitcoin so unique as an asset class, is it really was a retail-driven movement. Um, most asset classes start at the institutional side and then slowly trickle their way down to retail investors. Um, but Bitcoin actually did the opposite where it started with a really passionate, um, sort of philosophically motivated user base and then has been trickling upwards, which arguably has been a very different progression than many other trends we've seen in the financial services space and in the asset management space. So what I think has been interesting to watch, really, you know, the first three years that I worked in the industry from 2015 through about 2018, the majority of companies in the space were really focused on consumers. So the companies from that era that we're all really familiar with are companies like Coinbase, companies like Ripple, companies like Gemini, companies like BitPay, companies that were building on and off ramps that would allow people to buy and hold digital assets to trade them for one another and then allow people to use them for payments in a variety of different use cases. But they were all related to really uh, money and investing, right? Then I think in late 2017, still calling that consensus invest November 2017, I will never forget this day, the day that Bitcoin broke 10,000 and like 200 of us went out that night and we sat there and we all looked at each other and we were like, wow, this has become something that Wall Street's now interested in. And so from late 2017 till now, a lot of what we've seen in the Bitcoin space and in the crypto space generally has been built around connecting Wall Street and crypto in different ways. Um, we see this in the form of integrated brokerage firms that offer custody, clearing, execution, price discovery, and a variety of services. We see that in these new prime brokerage offerings that are emerging. We also see that in what we do as a business as asset managers. Um, we see a lot of new and existing asset managers creating products that include an allocation to Bitcoin or are entirely based on Bitcoin and other digital assets. So I think the last three years have really been characterized by a lot of capital, a lot of energy, and a lot of focus going into connecting the world of Wall Street and crypto and making crypto more institutional, if you will. And I think the phase we're going into now as we look at what's happening around the world, and certainly this is one of my aspirations, is the um, 
Bitcoin becoming part of and cryptocurrencies becoming part of um, central banks, etc. Now, what's interesting to note here is there's a few ways to look at this trend. I actually think that Bitcoin and stable coins um, that are backed by fiat currencies are the opposite of one another. So that'll be something we can talk about a bit. They're both relevant and very useful, but they're very different and very sort of far apart in terms of their aspirations. I think what's been really interesting to see is this new narrative starting to emerge about the importance of compute and connectivity in the context of cybersecurity and national defense. I think if you look at recent moves that have been made in the United States, um, Amazon Web Services is now the largest military contractor in this country. It's no longer people who manufacture physical things. It's really about securing data and data assets. So that's one data point. The other interesting data point is what's been happening on the semiconductor side. So as many people saw a few weeks ago, um, a number of semiconductor companies, including Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor, TSMC, and NVIDIA, have all committed to move manufacturing of semiconductors or chips that power computation back to the United States. And so there are now a number of very large capital intensive projects underway to onshore semiconductors and these critical hardware components for compute. We also see it playing out with the lawsuits against Huawei. Um, Huawei was, um, was uh, faced with RICO charges, racketeering charges. Huawei, as we know, has been uh, building out a lot of 5G infrastructure around the world. So I think that's very much politically motivated in the US um, has voiced its concerns about letting foreign governments um, participate in, in the build out of, of infrastructure in this country. So I think, um, Again, you know, five years from now, it would be very likely that 40% of Bitcoin mining, if not more, is done onshore in the United States. It's very likely that governments will view uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency networks as part of national security strategy. And I also think that uh, creating these harbors um, or creating these regulatory regimes where entrepreneurs want to build businesses and want to experiment with these new types of technologies will be an interesting competitive advantage, whether that's through tax benefits, um, whether that's through sort of regulation and financial permissiveness, similar to the way that Safe Harbor helped um, facilitate some of the early innovation on, on the internet in this country, whether that's through changes in laws around capital formation, which is a lot of what we've seen at the SEC and CFTC level. But I think, again, you know, we're getting to this point where um, government thinking about the future and the future is digital. Um, the future is very much about what happens in cyberspace. And so I think Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are an important part of that. There are a plethora of other technologies that are equally, if, if not more important. But if Bitcoin is going to be the, the world's global open permissionless financial network, then I think governments will have to sooner or later get involved in, in participating in that network. So that's my view. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I'm biased, um, but I'm optimistic that we'll see that develop more. No, it's interesting. I mean, you brought up a couple points I want to draw out there. One is, uh, I think this is underappreciated that as we're seeing a transition from, you know, retail users and kind of this, this kind of bottom up to institutional to maybe uh, banking on Bitcoin and, and banking on crypto, different things start to matter. So, you know, in, in the early days of crypto, the fact that semiconductors, these chips were being manufactured elsewhere, who cares, right? The industry is small. Retail users don't really care where these chips are manufactured, where mining's happening. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, even, even less in the early days when the chips mattered even less than, than they obviously do today. But now if we move towards more institutional, even governmental use cases, all of a sudden it matters. And you know, these, the, these geopolitical considerations of where chips are being manufactured, these supply chain considerations of where chips are being made, it starts to matter a lot. And yeah. the people well, that are then making those decisions yeah. care. I think one thing people don't realize is even from an investment perspective, right, through CoinShares Ventures, we invest in, in startups. Um, there are rules now. Uh, the U.S. implemented a series of new laws at the start of this year about invest U.S. firms investing in um, foreign owned entities and certain jurisdictions are off limits and there are limits on, you know, control persons. So I think, again, it's not just about where things are made or where they're produced, but it's about the flow of capital. And um, a lot of this really goes back to this geopolitical chess game unfolding. Um, and again, 
it's just very interesting. We don't talk about it a lot in the Bitcoin community or in the crypto community generally, but it does start to become really, really relevant as we think about the future. Sorry, I'll let you Absolutely. Know. No, I agree. And, and it feels, you know, if you had told us when we were getting back into the industry, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, that geopolitics would actually matter for these things, we would have said you're crazy, right? It would have, this, this felt totally outside of the geopolitical system. And now the realization is coming out that it's actually, it matters a lot what's happening in the world. And I, I think that fits into a second point you made, which is um, what crypto is, is fragmenting a little bit, but in a really positive way, right? The same way we see any industry develop when it starts, whether it's the internet industry or anything else, it starts with a really concentrated set of use cases. And then as those use cases grow, they end up looking very different from each other. And now, you know, the, the internet is an obvious analogy here. Different websites are totally different types of businesses. So yes, you know, amazon.com is a website and so is facebook.com, but their businesses look nothing alike. They're both internet businesses, but they're completely different business models and, and structures. And I think we're starting to see that happen in crypto where we started with this very narrow set of use cases. Everything was kind of analogous to each other, maybe of different quality, but you know, largely the same model. And now it's shattering out your, this fragmentation. And that means different people are going to care about different use cases. But at its core, I think the one internet analogy that really um, jumps out at me that I think is still really highly relevant, and we talked about this in our crypto trends report that we put out in November of last year, um, look, the internet and internet business models are all about monetizing eyeballs, right? So how do I get as many people as possible to come to my website and do something on my website? Now, in the case of Facebook and Google, it's all about selling advertising, right? So you're monetizing people's attention and you're monetizing the ability to aggregate users on your platform and, and capture their, their time and their energy. In the case of Amazon, you're doing something similar, but you're capturing users and attention by offering a variety of services and becoming almost a mega platform and you're connecting buyers and sellers, right? But at the end of the day, what drives the internet and business models on the internet as we know them is the monetization of eyeballs, right? Of your time, my time, our energy, our attention. To this day, the predominant business model in crypto for crypto companies um, is monetizing transaction flows. Effectively, all a blockchain is, is a communication protocol, and we're communicating different types of messages, and we're now seeing a plethora of different cryptographic primitives and blockchains emerging that allow people to communicate different things, whether that's who owns a set of UTXOs or who owns what assets, or whether that's you know instructions to run a program on a distributed network of compute resources, which is probably more akin to the Ethereum model. Um, there are a wide range of sort of use cases, but at the end of the day, blockchain-based business models are all about having transactions on a network, and businesses built on these networks are trying to monitor their role in facilitating transactions. So if you look at all the unicorns in this industry, they're financial services companies who command large volumes of transaction flow. And so again, I think one of the, the, the things we look at that's very analogous to the way the internet developed is at the end of the day right now, it's about having flow and it's about being able to aggregate a lot of flow. And it's about um, your ability to, to take a slice of any transactions that happen on these networks. The predominant model so far has been people exchanging crypto assets, right? Speculative trading is still by and far the number one use case for most cryptocurrencies. And so the reality is, is until we see a market develop for compute and connectivity resources, I think the predominant model is going to continue to be financial services driven, where it's all about monetizing transactions. And so the question I have is what type of compute and connectivity are people willing to pay for? Uh, just yesterday, I um, was on a prediction market. I placed a bet on it for $5 and my Ethereum gas fees were $4, right? And that's an example. I'm, I'm not using that in a negative way, like security and the use of a, a computational network, it has the cost. And right now the costs are fairly high. And so we tend to use these networks for transactions that require a high degree of security, it doesn't really make sense for me to use a lot of these networks for things that are lower security. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done um, in this arena. And I think it's going to take some time before we see unicorn companies emerge that aren't built around financial flows. 
But I'm also of the belief that at its core, every company is a financial services company. <laughs> and we see this in traditional tech as well, right? Like Facebook's looking at payments. Um, it's amazing that Shopify, you know, $100 billion company has one fifth of Facebook's market cap built exclusively on bringing payments tech into the Facebook platform. Um, Amazon selling into payments, Apple selling into payments. I'm sure Microsoft will do it at some point. Google will do it at some point. Like every company will become inevitably a financial services company. And so I think that's where um, Bitcoin in particular starts to become really interesting because you're providing this beautiful open financial network and this digitally native capability for people to transact. So I think the, the interesting things, like we try to talk about <laughs> moving away from finance and all these cool applications, but at the end of the day, um, it's, it's just like you, you use the network for what it does best. And right now the model is like you're paying for compute and connectivity resources. And eventually my view is it goes back to the cybersecurity angle, like eventually countries will compete for access to block space, right? Or for access to write data um, and information to the most secure financial network. And so in my view, this again, it starts to create a really interesting sort of opportunity um, to create new financial instruments, new marketplaces for financial compute and connectivity that haven't necessarily existed in the past. Yeah, super interesting. I mean, I think, well, first of all, you, you made an interesting point there. I forget who said it, but you know, every company expands their services until they offer a debit card. And we're seeing that now that all of these companies are just kind of stretching out and then all of a sudden, you know, a card pops out and, and that's the station off of these payment networks. I, I also think, you know, you mentioned a good one there that these countries may start competing for, for block space. That's a kind of a crazy concept because for so long, a lot of crypto was about how can we avoid, you know, politics in the world. And now all of a sudden, those same players that were being avoided are now becoming you know, players in the ecosystem itself. Um, and that I think marks a really important transition for the space that you know, they, at first they, they laughed at us and now all of a sudden they're joining us and saying, hey, this technology is actually really meaningful. You know, we have to find a way to, to participate in it. Right. But that but does think, bring up, I, go ahead. But I think you. it's not that they're joining us yet. I think right now what you're seeing is people are co-opting the idea and trying to implement it um, in different ways, right? Uh, central bank digital currencies have absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin. They're antithetical, right? Like you might as well just use a managed database. Like, I don't know why people are trying to even say they're blockchains. It's super cool. Um, it's super interesting, but it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Um, what I'm more interested in is like, how do we rebuild a new type of correspondent banking system that doesn't include any central banks. That to me is a far more interesting question than how do we take dollars and put them on a blockchain and exert US monetary policy through this new digital mechanism, right? So I think um, there's some interesting sort of like, I think, I don't know if it's deliberate. I believe it's deliberate. I think there's some deliberate misrepresentations when people talk about projects and call them blockchains. I'm like, no, it's, it's a database of debits and credits <laughs> on a central yep. bank structure. And it's, it's great and it's interesting and it allows central banks to extend um, you know, money in different directions and to extend all sorts of new services. But at its core, um, it has nothing to do with Bitcoin or why Bitcoin exists or what Bitcoin does. So I just think it's very interesting to see how propaganda is starting to come into this industry. Like governments are the best propaganda machines in the world. If you look at what's happening in this country, right? Like the propaganda machine has stopped working and people are looking at the situation. They're like, what is, what is happening in this country? And so um, what I think is really interesting is like, what's the shape of propaganda in this industry going to look like? And we're already starting to see it emerge. Man, there's a lot there. Yeah. I, I, well, first of all, I think the, the misrepresentations are a really interesting point because one of the challenges I think that we face, one of the tensions, at least that I feel is on one hand, some of these, these kind of centrally managed digital currencies have their upsides over existing fiat currencies. Now it's not pure upside, but they've got some upsides over fiat currencies. And so in some sense, yeah, you know, let's, let's move digital. Digital is good. I like that. But what's really tough is when that gets mixed in, often to your point, kind of intentionally with these pure decentralized networks, it, it hurts those networks in all sorts of ways by conflating the two of them. And so it's, it's challenging when you have something that might be, at least in some senses, better than the existing solutions, 
but when it's mixed in with something that it's not, it, it causes its own issues. Um, but, here's, but here's where the nuance comes in, right? In my view, it's not about better or worse, right? I'm not judge, jury, executioner. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of a false dichotomy to say better or worse. I think that different needs require different tools. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin and all of these other um, cryptocurrencies, digital fiat and these other projects, they're just tools that we're trying to use to solve different problems. In my view, the problem that Bitcoin solves is the problem of monetary uh, system choice, right? So if you um, live in the US and you look at what's happening and you're like, man, this is abs absolutely wild. Like I am not on board with this. I can't not pay my taxes because I'll go to jail. The government has a monopoly on violence. So like I can't rebel, right? So I think was one of the last conscientious objectors we had. Yeah. And it's 150 years later, we're still having the same conversation. So like, that's not gonna work. Um, I can go and protest, but arguably like the results are mixed. I could run for office, but that's a whole process. So what, what do I have? When voice doesn't work, people use exit. And so I think one of the interesting things is Bitcoin is a way to exit the US dollar monetary regime and everything that it stands for. Um, and that means different things to different people, which is really um, one of the wonderful things about Bitcoin is it can mean a lot of different things to different people. And those things can exist um, without being in conflict. But for me, I think the value is like, let's give people tools for the system. So, you know, when we're talking about a payment system and using, you know, a, a dollar collateralized coin, like great, if, if that helps people solve problem, great. But it doesn't help people solve the problem I think we have, which is the problem of financial censorship, financial control, and a fundamental lack of privacy and a fundamental lack of rights. And so different tools for different jobs. But I think um, when it comes to, you know, money for the resistance or money as a way to exit, Bitcoin really is the, the leading horse in that race. And I think will be forever. Yeah. It doesn't, no, I it doesn't help, but for that express purpose, yeah. that's what excites me. Absolutely. And, and one, I think, underappreciated aspect there is that, um, you know, if you go back and look at the, the classic kind of exit versus voice paradigm, one of the interesting things that, that Bitcoin enables is partial exit for the first time. Historically, kind of this concept of exit has been a total exit, like a, I'm going to exit this country. I'm, I'm physically leaving and I'm saying I'm no longer a citizen of wherever it is that you originally were. But now we have this idea of a, a partial exit that, you know, I have some, some total of wealth and I, you know, you can move parts of it in different places now and kind of adhere to different systems and express kind of a, a probabilistic uh, view instead of an absolute binary it's one. It's almost like physical jurisdiction doesn't define us anymore. Like this is part of what to me is so cool about this. Like I read a lot of sci-fi books and sitting here like surrounded by my sci-fi <laughs> the idea, like, if we live in cyberspace, um, we have all of these different realities in which we exist, these different virtual worlds, worlds, pardon, and so the ability to, like, move across those worlds and to be different people and to hold different ideas um, that sometimes are in conflict with one another, right? Like, I have ideas that are in conflict with one another all the time, and the ability to do that simultaneously, as you expressed, I think that's so, so cool. I and rebalance that. over time, right? Like that, that I can now say, hey, something changed. I feel differently about something and re-express my, my allocation in, in any way that I want. Um, <laughs> we are, we're, we're running short on time. This is, we tools for the resistance and, uh, and what crypto means. Well, we like I, I, I do want to touch ideas, Andy. Like we got to have big brain ideas. <laughs> we got to have big brain ideas. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up on the, on the smaller brain ideas later. Uh, but, uh, but I do want to maybe ask one question uh, as we wrap up here. If we're moving into this next era and we're seeing these transitions that we've been talking about from, you know, Bitcoin going from consumer to institutional to, to maybe banking, uh, if we're seeing kind of the early days move into mania, move into tools for the resistance, if we're seeing what you didn't really touch on, you know, this transition from fintech to, to you know, open finance, um, yeah. what are the big companies? Like if we look out five or 10 years from now, We've seen, obviously, a lot of companies capitalize on those, those early trends and bet on retail traders and this kind of speculation. Are those still the biggest companies in five or 10 years? Or are we seeing 
other people come in and take their place. Look, I think the biggest companies are going to be banks. Um, we're reconceptualizing what being a bank means. I actually am most excited um, about removing custody from banking institutions. I wrote a long blog post uh, called The Battle for Assets, which is all about how custody and assets under custody, AUC, assets under management, AUM, have really defined the world of modern banking over the last 500 years. What's so interesting to me about digital currencies is I no longer have to entrust my gold coins to the church. I no longer have to entrust my share certificates to my broker. I no longer have to entrust my dollars, which are really like digital dollars on a spreadsheet at a bank somewhere. I no longer have to entrust those to JP Morgan Chase or to Citi or to Wells Fargo. What's really cool to me about um, these banks of the future, like today the stickiness of deposits is really high. Only 4% of consumer deposits in the banking space move on a yearly basis. So banks don't really have to compete to serve their customers, they serve themselves. What I think is really cool about the crypto space is collateral becomes really fluid because you can move your assets from one platform to another with the click of a button. And you know, in Bitcoin, you know, it's 10 minutes for a block um, to, to get uh, processed. And then it's typically six confirmations, so 60 minutes, and then your transfer is done. There are other protocols in which it happens faster. Lightning obviously is making that way faster and instantaneous for payments. But what I think is so cool is you're no longer locked into one custodian, which then defines what services you have access to. So basically taking these vertically integrated banking structures that have been built and then spread it, like shattering them into networks where you have custody of your assets, you can come in any variety of ways and you can have a little bit of each, right? You could like self custody 25%, custody 25% with a full on like cold storage custodian and then leave the remaining 50% in a platform. But companies in the crypto space now actually have to compete to be best in class and to give users what they want. And so I think the companies that are gonna be the best at doing that, you know, it, like Binance is great at giving one group of customers what they want. Same with BitMEX and Deribit. Same in some ways with the BlockFi's of the world who are giving people yield. So what we'll start to see, I think, is a set of financial services firms that are giving people more of what they want and actually have to compete for those deposits, for that collateral, for those transactions. And so I'm hoping it starts to flip some of that power dynamic um, that we've seen in the traditional banking space where banks, like, they don't have to serve customers because customers can't leave. Yeah, really I interesting. I wish we could talk for much longer here, uh, but I think we have to wrap up three, uh, three recommendations that folks were interested in what we say here uh, to dig in more. First of all, uh, the, the article Milton just mentioned, Battle for Assets, um, worth reading and understanding those dynamics, because I think that's going to be a really important transition to go into this next era. And we're, we're already seeing some of it, but it's coming out to, to bear much more uh, now. A second, also mentioned the, the CoinShares uh, trends report from last year. Um, one of the really good pieces of research in terms of just like taking a step back and saying, what is going on here? Not on a day by day basis, but what are the macro uh, things we're seeing? And then uh, last of all, I would say, oh, the uh, last year, uh, Melvin had a had a congressional testimony about uh, this kind of difference between, at its core, these decentralized assets and these, these non-decentralized digital assets that are starting to come out. Um, and so going and watching that uh, is, is a good place to get an understanding of that difference. Um, Melton, thanks for doing this. Almost as fun as a real in-person chat <laughs> and, uh, and spending some time. But uh, big okay. thanks to the well, Unified team for having us. Yeah, please. Next time I'm going to grill you, Andy. So Next ready. time. We'll do it. To flip I look the forward tables. to it. Awesome. Great. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you guys enjoy Unitize. Yeah, enjoy. Bye everyone.